Well, welcome to the, uh, you better hold it down. <laughs> welcome to the Ida Johnson Lecture Series. And those of you that don't know, uh, this series was started by our own Ida Johnson quite a few years ago. And Ida has, uh, has passed on. And so we, uh, we renamed our lecture series in her honor because she did it all for years and years. And tonight, um, we have a speaker, Austin, is uh, going to uh, give us a little talk, and I guess it's on the Lost West, and I'll let him introduce it all. Austin was a graduate of C.M. Russell High School here in Great Falls. Um, he also graduated from Grizz Capital, University of Montana, and with a degree in history. And he's worked at several places. He told them to me, and I forgot some of them. That's all I did to you. But right now, he's working here at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center. And um, what well, is your title here, anyway? I don't even know. <laughs> interpreter Ranger. Interpreter, interpreter Ranger. There you go. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn the mic over to Austin and um, Austin Haney and. Um, I didn't take it from there, and if you have any questions, Norman has asked us to kind of hold your questions until the end. Uh, yeah, as Lee said, uh, bonjour et bienvenue uh, to the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center here. A uh, little background, um, I have worked here at the center a couple times in my past, and uh, most recently have done a couple stints with the National Park Service at Bear Paw Battlefield in Chinook, Montana and Ben's Old Fort down in Lahana, Colorado. Um, I've always had, uh, for the last couple years here, a very deep interest in uh, French history as well as uh, kind of the Canadian connections uh, here in the States. So this program was kind of born out of that interest. Um, going forward here, uh, like Lee said, we'll have a little question session at the end. So. Feel free there, we'll probably unmute you guys on Zoom. Uh, for those of you here live in Great Falls, Montana, thank you guys for coming out. and We'll uh, integrate you guys in there as well. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into the Lost West. So many of us in the Lewis and Clark world, we are very familiar with this map. Uh, done by Aaron Aerosmith. It depicts uh, North America as it would have appeared at the dawn of the 19th century. This is the world as uh, Lewis and Clark knew it. Of course, you see represented on this map, you've got the United States uh, ending at the Mississippi River, Spanish territories to the southwest, and a British behemoth in the north. But what many people don't realize is that on this map, actually, are the last vestiges of the French Empire in North America. All the way off here, but anyways, all the way off here in the corner of Newfoundland, there are two little islands, St. Pierre and Miquelon. When France ceded its North American colonies in 1763, uh, they actually retained these two little islands. That's still French territory to this day, and uh, as such, it's kind of the last vestige, uh, physically, of this lost empire in North America. But of course, that's all the way out in the east. We're talking about the Lost West. So we are going to go a little bit and explore just how deep the story of New France goes. Stretching from the St. Lawrence Gulf here in the east, south to the bayous of Louisiana, north to the icy waters of Hudson Bay, and west to the spine of the Shining Mountains. Needless to say, this is not a small empire. <laughs> and it all starts over here with uh, this guy. There had been some early exploration into what we now call Canada and the eastern United States. Uh, French fishermen, uh, Explores uh, John Cabot, or Giovanni Cabato, if you are familiar with his Italian name. And uh, Jacques Cartier, he's kind of the first guy to really 
go in depth in what we call Canada now. But no one really stays until our friend Samuel de Champlain. He's uh, the son of a fishing family from the south of France, went into a career as a soldier, and had won favor with the royal family. And he sent all the way out to the territory that Cartier had explored to establish a colony. Uh, utilizing Algonquin guides, he heads up the St. Lawrence, and at a place the natives call Quebec, where the river narrows, he's invited to build a fort. Uh, this is the first French permanent settlement in the area, and is really kind of the uh, genesis of what would become French Canada. Uh, it's not an easy go for these guys in the beginning. Uh, they are facing competition from the English, from the Basque. They're getting attacked and raided all the time. And, well, how many of you guys have been to Canada here uh, in the audience? Raise your hands. Yeah, pretty cold up there in the winter, right? I think uh, two weeks ago, the top ten coldest places in the world, uh, nine of the ten were in Canada. <laughs> So it's not an easy go. Uh, they have to find a way to succeed. They're small in number, they are constantly getting pushed around and bullied by larger groups like the English uh, and natives like the Iroquois. And Champlain kind of pioneers the path to success that would kind of define the French experience, at least with indigenous peoples, uh, almost up to the very end. He strikes a middle ground. This is sort of this idea that if you work together, it might not be perfect all the time, but so long as each side lives up to their side of the bargain, they will persevere against larger enemies. Tribes like the Algonquins, the Mi'kmaq, the Huron are the real big one. They all come together through this alliance of trade, intermarriage, and war. And that really is the key to New France's success from the beginning. They're not going off the Spanish model and kind of lording down from the top. They're not following the English model. They are persevering and going with their own path. So Champlain also starts some other trends uh, in New France. Uh, out of exploration, he pushes through two Georgian Bay on Lake Huron, uh, south into the Lake Champlain area in New York, and kind of sets this pattern of gentlemen from New France heading out into the uh, wilds of North America. And there are two real big routes up the St. Lawrence and into the west at this time, which is nowadays kind of the heartland of both the United States and uh, Canada. Uh, the two main paths are in the south, you can head up towards Lake Erie and eventually end up in the Ohio drainage and take you down all the way to lower Mississippi. Uh, the northern part of this route will take you all the way up through Lake Huron and Superior into what is called the Pays d'Arco, the upper country. So some of the real big names that kind of come about in this time we have uh, Robert Cavalier, Sir de la Salle, he goes down the Ohio River and the Lower Mississippi in the 1670s. Uh, his northern counterparts, a really famous duo of a traitor and a Jesuit priest, uh, Joliet and Marquette, they explore all through Upper Michigan, uh, parts of Ontario, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Uh, they actually head down the Mississippi River and are the first Europeans to see the mouth of the Missouri River. And they were quite terrified. <laughs> they said it was one of the wildest rivers they'd ever seen and uh, had no real interest going up it. But uh, as a lot of you Lewis and Clarkies probably know, uh, this is a river that's going to really figure heavy into our story as we go along. Uh, all this exploration into the Mississippi drainage system uh, by folks like La Salle, Joliet, and Marquette, uh, leads to the establishment of the province of Louisiana, or as the French would call it, La Louisiane. 
1682. Forts, missions, villages, that soon follows. Uh, the most famous being Kaskaskia, which is another name a lot of you guys might recognize. It'll figure into the Lewis and Clark story here. Now, some contemporaries of guys like Joliet, Marquette, and LaSalle are folks we would call uh, the Coureur de Bois, Runners of the Woods. These guys are out in the Pays Don Ho, uh, up in the Upper Great Lakes, and they are doing a lot of fur trading. Uh, at New France at this time, not exactly what we'd call a growing economic concern. Uh, you may be considered uh, wealthy, air quotes on that, but still be dirt poor. The easiest way for these folks in New France to make a fortune is to go into the fur trade. And uh, two really great examples of this are a pair of friends, uh, Radisson and Grossier. They are guys out in the Pays Don Ho, they are fur trading to kind of make their fortune. And while they're out there, they start hearing tales of rich fur lands far to the north on a sea. They realize that this is probably a pretty good idea. Furs are much better in colder climates. That's just part of the game with fur-bearing animals. So they overstay their trading license. Uh, the system at this time is uh, to trade you have to approach the governor in New France and request a license. And it usually lasts about a year, but God forbid you uh, overstay your welcome. And unfortunately, that's exactly what Radisson and Grissier do. They decide that the opportunity to get some of these rich northern furs is too good to pass up. So they overstay their trading license. They think that they're just going to paddle down into Quebec City show the governor this rich hall of furs and be able to convince him that, hey, we got to hop on this now. They get into Quebec City, they do exactly that, and you'd think that the governor would be very appreciative of their efforts, right? No. Oh. <laughs> he confiscates their furs. So that is essentially a year of their lives uh, spent risking their necks, their literal necks, in the Bays Don Ho, uh, a very, very lawless, violent country at the time. Uh, they just risked their lives and lost everything they put into it. Their dreams of fortune, gone. And, uh, well, they're not very happy about that. And they start thinking, hmm, what is a group of people in this world that has absolutely no scruples at all and wouldn't mind getting their hands on some money? And, of course, the Frenchmen know the answer, the English. So they head to Boston and decide to pitch their idea there. Evidently, it had some weight. So they get sent off all the way to London to pitch their idea in front of King Charles II himself. Now, these Boston merchants are a little more apt to go for this idea than the already rich lords sitting comfortable in court in London. They're kind of skeptical. That is pretty much all but one. A very colorful and eccentric character uh, called Prince Rupert. He's the king's cousin, not exactly his favorite guy, but the life of the party, willing to throw his money around and invest in crazy ideas. And I don't know how they did it, but these two Frenchmen from rural Canada convinced this English lord to fund their crazy idea. And thus, uh, Prince Rupert, with his money, with his influence with the king, secures a royal charter for this group called uh, the Company of Honorable Adventurers from England Trading into Hudson's Bay. God, that's a mouthful. We know it better today as the Hudson's Bay Company. This is the beginning of France's northern rival. Fun fact for you, the bay is actually still in existence today. It's more of a shopping mall, but you can actually still shop at Hudson's Bay.
I've done it. It's quite fun. <laughs> so all of this would lead to some conflict, you'd think, with the English, with other people in North America. The Dutch are also in, but they're kind of getting out at this time. Uh, the main thing that we have to see here, uh, starting around 1780, uh, right at the very end of Charles II's reign, we start getting some conflict. But it's not North America's problems that are creating these wars. It is good old-fashioned European drama. It's like a 18th century soap opera. So King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, uh, as we know them here stateside, uh, War of the Grand Alliance, War of the Spanish Succession, and War of the Austrian Succession is a, <laughs> another term over in Europe. Essentially, these guys over in Europe are arguing over who is supposed to be king or queen. And it blows over into North America. A little ridiculous, but what can you do? But the French have this grand idea involving our little friends up on Hudson Bay. They decide, well, let's push those English out. We claim the territory. Radisson and Grussier were French, it's ours. So they attacked between 1780 and 1713, they attacked the English posts on Hudson's Bay no less than nine times. Uh, it gets so bad that several times uh, the Hudson's Bay Company factories out there get completely destroyed and ransacked. Uh, the French, by all means, are controlling the bay and really are kind of winning this war. But when the treaties come, when the wars in Europe are ended, they don't care what happens in North America. The English get to keep Hudson's Bay, and the French abandon their claims in 1713. In response to all this, the Hudson's Bay Company actually beefs up their presence, ironically trying to get rid of the pay, convinces them that they need to do more and be more proactive so they can stay. And they build this place. Prince of Wales Fort. It is in the middle of nowhere. Churchill, Manitoba. Famous for three things. This place, the Northern Lights, and having more polar bears than just about anywhere in the world. That should tell you enough about where the Hudson's Bay Company is operating at this time. But overall, France, in trying to poke the British bear, uh, has convinced the Bay that it's here to stay. Now, things kind of settle down into a Cold War at this time. They are not really interested in fighting with the English, now turned the British, and there's kind of a rhythm of fur trading going back, similar to what you have uh, in the years prior. Now, one of these guys out here is a fellow by the name of Pierre Gaultier, Sir de la Verandre. If you haven't noticed a trend lately, is uh, these French guys sure do love their names. Now, la Verandre is uh, another one of these minor nobles in New France. And just like most of them, he is dirt poor. Not a penny to his name. So he goes out to the fur trade to make his fortune. He's at a place called Canonistiqua, which is up at the very western tip of Lake Superior. This is sort of the limit of typical French influence at this time in the upper country. But he starts hearing from local tribes up there of a great lake with many rivers flowing into it and out of it that leads to a western sea. Le Verandre uh, checks this out, concludes that Lake Winnipeg does not go to the western sea, it goes to Hudson's Bay, but nevertheless he considers this the key to the continent. From here he can go anywhere he wants. He can go south up the Red River into the heartlands of the Dakotas and Minnesota. He can go west of the Saskatchewan system or the Assiniboine system and end up 
uh, all over the Canadian prairies and into North Dakota. Or you can go to the bay, but, well, he didn't want to do that. Now, while he's out kind of scouting out the Lake Winnipeg area, he starts hearing, again, from Native peoples that there are a very strange tribe who live and look like Frenchmen to the south. This is kind of playing into that European beloved myth of uh, the Welsh Indians. And Laverne Andre is naturally curious. Uh, most modern scholars now think that the Assiniboines who told him this were probably just trying to get him to go away. But nevertheless, Laverne Andre decides that he's going to head on out and find these French Indians. Well, he gets to the Missouri River in 1739. And he sees some stupendous towns, earth lodge villages, nestled along the banks of the river. But they're not French. Far from it. They're Mandans and Hudsons. These are agricultural people who have one of the main trade areas in the Northern Plains. Uh, one of the biggest in North America, actually. So he leaves two of his men behind there to learn the language. And this is really kind of the start of that very close relationship between the Earth Lodge peoples and uh, Europeans, traders, explorers, that will factor in later with Lewis and Clark, actually. It's uh, from the Mandan villages in 1742 that one of his sons and uh, the brother of the son there, so two of his sons, the Chevalier and his brother, we don't really know who, they don't really specify, their journal is not really kept up very well, but regardless, the Chevalier and his brother decide to leave the Earth Lodge villages with a party of visiting natives who are there to... Sorry, I might have to switch into French. My English is failing me. But they decide to go out with a party of natives who have been trading at the villages. They take them west uh, to an overview where the Chevalier says they saw shining mountains off in the distance. Uh, some people think that they only got as far as the Black Hills. Uh, some people say they made it to the Bighorns. We will probably never actually know for certain, because unfortunately for us, their navigational instruments broke almost immediately after they set out. Their journals did not really do a good job of telling us where they went, so it's anybody's guess as to where they actually were. But we think they probably headed down through southwest North Dakota, into the southeast corner of Montana, and into north central Wyoming, before heading down the Laramie chain, crossing across the plains, back to the Missouri, and up to the one known place that we actually know they really, truly made it. Uh, Pierre, South Dakota, near the Eurigera villages at that time, uh, they decide that they're going to leave something behind uh, that's physical, that really solidifies their presence. This. They brought along one of these heavy lead tablets to set down and claim this land for France. On one side, it's all in Latin. Of course, you can see Petrus Gaultier de la Vere Andre. On the other side, uh, scratched in with a knife in French, was uh, the Chevalier and his companions uh, and the date that they put that in the ground. Now, ironically, this actually sits in a museum in Pierre, South Dakota. Uh, about 100 or so years ago, uh, two kids were playing on a hillside and actually kicked this thing up out of the dirt. <laughs> Didn't know what it was, but guy in town who kind of knew some French was kind of getting a little uh, wide-eyed when he saw that. And uh, thus, we actually have a pretty good record, uh, physically anyways, of just where the Baron Gray, uh, he kind of ended up. Unfortunately for him, uh, personal tragedy and kind of changing tides in New France really puts an end to his explorations and fort building in the West. Uh, he loses a son along the way, his eldest, uh, in a Sioux ambush. And he's starting to get in failing health by the end of the 1740s. So he heads back to Montreal. He heads back to Montreal, and he's actually planning another expedition in 1749. 
uh, when, unfortunately, Lavera Dre uh, ends up being no more. And this actually is kind of on the cusp of the end of New France. In 1750, we're starting to get into a much more tense period with the British and their colonies in North America. Uh, the French have claimed the Ohio country, the drainage uh, in the modern Midwest there, uh, through right of discovery. They were the first Europeans on the watershed, thus it's theirs. Never mind the fact that it's claimed by many, many different indigenous peoples. The French aren't about that game. They're, they're all for the middle ground and working with them, but so long as they are in charge, air quotes, that's kind of how this is going to work. The British, on the other hand, they actually claim that same area as part of their colonial charters, particularly the colony of Virginia. And it's a rather comical ballet that kind of goes back and forth. Uh, the French start establishing posts in this disputed land. Uh, there are English, British traders out there, some settlers and farmers, and they're starting to be some conflict between the different tribes, the French, and these newcomers. So, back and forth, uh, the two sides actually send envoys uh, to essentially tell the other side to get off my land. To which the person that's receiving them very humorously, uh, <laughs> politely, you know, takes them to dinner, shows them a good time at the fort, and tells them, bugger off, this is ours. And this goes back and forth. The French send parties to the English telling them to go away. The English send parties to the French to tell them to go away. And it's in one of these uh, parties, led by an enterprising young British officer by the name of George Washington. Probably heard that name before. Well, he's on his way to a French fort in what is now Pennsylvania when he stumbles upon a French party led by uh, the Ambassador Jumonville. And, well, doesn't look good for old Georgie here, but his party kills Jumonville. This blows up into an international incident and leads to what we know here in the States as the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War. Now, the French early on are actually quite successful, uh, partly because of their native allies. They utilize their tactics to kind of get the upper hand on the British early on. Uh, a good example of this is uh, Fort Duquesne in 1755. George Washington is back in the picture. Uh, he and a British army uh, led by Edward Braddock are trying to head out to Fort Duquesne in modern Pittsburgh, and they're ambushed uh, partway to the fort by a mixed column of French infantry, uh, French militia from Canada, and natives. Uh, you guys ever seen that movie, Last of the Mohicans? Uh, do you remember that scene where they're leaving the fort and they're all marching in these wonderful, orderly columns, scarlet blazing, flags flaring in the air, you know? And then all of a sudden, you hear the war whoops and they're getting hit from the woods on either side. That's kind of what's going on. It's remarkably accurate, believe it or not. Uh, that's kind of what spells uh, success for the French at this time. They are facing a huge numerical disadvantage. At any given time, there are only 70,000 people in the whole of New France. Remember that giant area I described for you guys? That's like the population of uh, Missoula, a little less than Missoula, actually. Uh, that would be like them spread out over most of the continent versus one and a half million people clustered in the Atlantic colonies, uh, the classic 13 that you probably know from grade school. So the French are very much on the ropes unless they get aggressive early on. And their main hope in victory is to just kind of keep the English away. Uh, and they do pretty well throughout the first years of the French and Indian War. 
But all that starts changing when uh, the commander, a uh, fellow by the name of Montcalm, the Marquis de Montcalm, he starts demanding uh, from his native allies a little bit more European behavior. He doesn't want them uh, going to war for scalps and captives and returning home uh, at the end of the year. He wants prolonged European campaigning. All year round, we are going to push those English back. Well, the native allies kind of say, nah, we're not into that kind of lifestyle. Uh, we're just going to go home, uh, have fun with that. And so the native allies actually start leaving the French behind. Uh, the French, once they started getting a little more controlling and demanding, uh, breaking that middle ground, that bargain with the native peoples, that's when they start losing them. And that's really when New France starts to lose. Uh, 1759 is not a good year for the French. Uh, Louisbourg, the gateway to the St. Lawrence, it falls early in the year, and that opens the gates all the way to Quebec City. And in September of that year, one of the single most cataclysmic events in the history of North America takes place on the Plains of Abraham. The British bring a fleet all the way up to Quebec City. They bombard the town, but the French are feeling quite happy. The cliffs, the nature of Quebec itself, protects them. So long as the walls do not fall, they can outlast the British. But that's when a young guy by the name of General James Wolfe pops into this story and decides to mess everything up. Wolfe, somehow, through incredible odds, leads an assault up these cliffs and onto the plains. The French in Quebec City are so shocked by this development that they haphazardly rush out to meet General Wolfe. In their disarray, two volleys ring out from British lines, and the French begin to flee, panicked, all the way back to the gates of the city. Those two volleys are the death knells of New France. Montreal holds out for another year, and the French try and fight back, but it's essentially all over at the end of the day here on the Plains of Abraham. Uh, Wolf himself is actually killed in the battle, as is Montcalm. So, <laughs> it's, it's one heck of a story. I, I wish I could give an hour-long program on this. But at the end of the day, uh, with the Treaty of Paris in 1763, it leaves the French nationless. The world has turned upside down for these people, and they have to find a new way. One of these uh, developments, actually, through the end of the French and Indian War, is uh, Louisiana goes to Spain, Canada goes to Britain, and uh, the eastern chunk of Louisiana on the eastern side of the Mississippi River, that goes to Britain as well. Uh, at the end of the American Revolution, that goes to the United States. But over in Spanish Louisiana, we've got some developments. This is a, sort of an unwanted misfit colony. Spain never really did anything with it. France never really did anything with it. This was kind of always, uh, for lack of a better analogy, you guys ever forgot something on the stove when you're cooking? It's essentially one of those kind of things. You don't really think about it until it burns and blows up. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, Spanish and French relations prior to this are not the best. Uh, we oftentimes in the 19th century look at Spain and France as being buddy-buddy, walking down the yellow brick road arm in arm and singing kumbaya. Nope. <laughs> uh, a good example of this is the Velasco expedition of 1720. Now, the border between Spanish-held uh, territories in the southwest parts of modern-day Texas, New Mexico. Uh, the border with that and French Louisiana had always been unclear. Uh, even into the American period, uh, what would become Mexico 
and the United States, that border was a mess all the way up into the 1840s. Now, Pedro Velasquez, he sent from Santa Fe in 1720 uh, to try and check some of this influence coming from the French on the Missouri River and the Mississippi. Uh, the French are trading guns, uh, metal items, textiles, things that really kind of disrupt the Spanish system in their colonies. So Pedro's out there to show them French who's boss in the West. He gets about to Omaha, Nebraska and is camped for the evening when all of a sudden a mixed group of natives allied to the French, uh, consisting of Oto, Pawnee, maybe some Missouris, and uh, according to Spanish rumors, some actual Frenchmen, <laughs> uh, they attack and massacre Velasquez's party. Uh, the image that you see on your screen is actually uh, from a painting depicting this massacre. There's old Velasquez uh, lying dead with the red coat and the gold braid. Quite a flattering portrait, if I do say so myself. But this kind of ends Spanish influence heading north into the plains. Uh, the French try reaching out in a more friendly way than they did with Pedro uh, through the persons of the Malat brothers. They are guys from Kaskaskia. Remember how I said that that would probably play into our story a little bit? Well, it is sort of the uh, center of French Louisiana, at least in the upper part of the province. And these guys decide that, well, eh, it's time we go pay a visit to Santa Fe and make some money. So, which way do you go to get to Santa Fe in the 1730s? Why, up the Missouri, of course. They get as far as modern South Dakota before they start thinking, mm, this river's not going in the right direction, maybe we should turn around. So they head back down and they kind of cross country and end up, uh, ironically, at La Junta, Colorado, where uh, I worked at Ben's Fork. <laughs> and from there, they pioneer what would later become Santa Fe Trail. Uh, they get there, and the Spanish are actually very receptive to this idea of cooperation with the French. Uh, not a lot of goods filter up from Mexico City at this time, so anything they can do to get a couple nice things for Christmas, well, <laughs> they're apt for it. So they head back to Kaskaskia with this wonderful news, the Spanish are ready to trade. They try heading back a second time, don't quite get there, but they decide to go for a third go-around. They get to Santa Fe, and bada-bing, bada-boom, those friendly Spanish are not so friendly anymore. Uh, one of the brothers is actually thrown in jail, and is never heard from again. He disappears in Mexico City. Uh, we actually still to this day do not know what happened to him. But that kind of ends this uh, process of trying to cooperate between the two economically. Uh, Spanish Louisiana does give us St. Louis and St. Charles, so it's not all a blank spot. Uh, and also, uh, you see some of the first official explorations after the French coming through uh, Spanish Louisiana. Uh, one of these guys, if you notice that name, Trudeau, sounds very uh, French-Canadian, right? I, th I think there's some politician in Canada with that name, right? Uh, nobody special. <laughs> uh, sarcasm. <laughs> but they are all over, uh, both officially and unofficially. You have traders regularly going up as far as the Mandans at this time, most of them French. But all good things must come to an end, including uh, Spanish Louisiana, and it's secretly ceded back to France. Yay! The French are back, baby! The only problem is they're not here to stay. The Treaty of San Ildefonso uh, secretly gives France the territory back, but the Spanish continue to administer it as if nothing had happened. Uh, it's even surprising to the Americans when they go to approach uh, buying Louisiana, they approach the Spanish and they tell them, it's, it's not ours, you talk to the Frenchies over there. Uh, so the purpose of this is not to dive into the Louisiana Purchase. We 
Lewis and Clarkies talk about this all the time. Uh, but the real important thing to get in terms of the French story is that this, uh, air quotes, return of France is incredibly short and final. When it's ceded to the Americans, they're gone. And the French are left to adjust to a new world once again, this time uh, an American one, which has different challenges. And this is where our good friends, Lewis and Clark, pop in. They, at one time, if you include the 1804 parties as members of Lewis and Clark, which I do, at one time a full quarter of the expedition was made up of people of French heritage. Uh, some of them, uh, Jean-Baptiste Deschamps, Francois Rivet, Charles Pinot, Jean-Baptiste La Jeunesse, Paul Primo, Charles Hibert, Etienne Malbouf, Pierre Roy, Charles Cogui, La Liberté, Augustine Roque. Uh, these are mostly temporary guys, but each one connects to this story of New France. Uh, the French of Lewis and Clark, these guys are literally a cross-section of the old French Empire. Uh, you've got guys from Canada. You have people that are old Louisiana. You have folks that are uh, products of that middle ground. They are the children of natives and the French from different parts of the fur trading world, uh, both the Great Lakes and Canadian trade uh, and the old Ohio country. And most of these guys, uh, from a genealogical purpose, ah, there goes my English again, i got to switch to French. But most of these guys, from a genealogical perspective, are quite fascinating. They're all connected in one way or another. Uh, you're looking at uh, folks like Balboeuf and La Jeunesse. They are brothers-in-law. Baptiste Deschamps and I think it was Pinot. Uh, they are actually uncle and nephew. Uh, you have guys that end up having their families cross later in life. But it's really kind of an interesting story, uh, these often forgotten people involved with Lewis and Clark. But of course there are some guys of French heritage that make a little bit bigger of an impact with Lewis and Clark. These are folks like George Triard. He is the son of a French trader and a Shawnee mother uh, from the old Illinois, Ohio country. He's from Detroit, Michigan actually. Uh, Pierre Cruzat, he's another one of these children of the fur trade. Uh, son of a Frenchman and an Omaha, so he's a product of the Missouri River explorations at the time. Same with Labiche. Uh, LePage, he's old Kaskaskia. His family goes back decades in that part of the world. And of course, who can forget the uh, <laughs> man of no merit himself, Toussaint Charbonneau, uh, born in Montreal. So we've got a French Canadian representing that old uh, Quebecois influence, and, oh geez, I could just talk forever about these guys, but I will not do that. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about what happens uh, with them and sort of the French story as it relates to them after Lewis and Clark. So some of these guys end up actually going back up to Missouri. This is their life. They are fur traders. Uh, some of those involved with Lewis and Clark include uh, Driard, LePage, and uh, Cruzat Brevet, and even Primo. So Charles Fortin, he's another Frenchman. He brings up a lot of uh, fire Northwest Company, XY Company people, and they actually are in Montana in 1807. We uh, like to think of John Coulter and his buddies as the first mountain men, but right on their heels, uh, their, mo their moccasin heels, <laughs> We've got the French, and we think that Cruzat and Rive are probably with Corten. Uh, David Thompson, a very famous name in Canadian circles, uh, he actually pushes in to the west side of the Divide in 1807, utilizing mostly French uh, hirelings for bringing his goods up. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, Lisa. He's a Spaniard, a product of Spanish Louisiana. Uh, he also employs a lot of Frenchmen, including Driard and LePage. So these guys are everywhere in the West. You guys ever notice uh, how going around you see a lot of French names with 
different people still here in the area, different French place names. Yeah, blame the fur trade. <laughs> Uh, some of their fates, uh, it's as diverse a lot as their stories. Driar, Cruzac, LePage, they all lie in the Indian country. Uh, Charbonneau, Labiche, Reve, they have very productive careers in the fur trade. Uh, Charbonneau, of course, he pops up in fur trade journals long into the 1830s and 40s. Well, not the 40s, but his son does as well. Uh, Labiche, he is listed as a winner with the American Fur Company as late as the 1830s. He may have come back to Montana. We just don't know right now. And Reve, he's, he's one of my favorites. He was already really, really old when he went with Lewis and Clark. He was in his late 40s. Uh, he ended up kind of juggling around. He was with Charles Cortin. He was with David Thompson for a while. Uh, he went on to a very productive career with uh, the Hudson Bay Company and actually died in Portland, Oregon in 1852 as one of the founding fathers of that state, well, future state. Uh, people like Rive, he's a great example of the beginnings of the Métis people. A lot of these French uh, end up mixing with the different native peoples in the area and creating their own unique culture of the Métis. Uh, but most of them, unfortunately, uh, drift away into obscurity, just like a lot of the French in the United States. Uh, there are some differences between Canada and the United States and how our French heritage has kind of gone away or stayed. In Canada, uh, the Métis are actually recognized as one of Canada's indigenous peoples. They are a cornerstone of the culture up there. Uh, Quebecois, you see people in Quebec, they still have a vibrant culture and history to this day. Uh, but here in the United States, unfortunately, uh, outside of Louisiana and parts of Maine, uh, a lot of this has disappeared over the years. That old Missouri Creole culture uh, that guys like Labiche, Cruzat would have been a part of, uh, LePage, the old uh, Louisiana folks, that's gone away. It's been assimilated into a larger American culture, which kind of symbolizes, in a way, this idea of a lost West. France definitely lost the West. They aren't here. But the French didn't. They still are here. Uh, evidenced by people like the Métis, evidenced by the place names. Grand Teton National Park, that's a French name, the Teton River. Uh, it's a very uh, not appropriate for, for children translation of the name. Uh, ask me about that after the program. <laughs> but it's, it's everywhere around us. And when I was titling this program, I was kind of struggling with this idea of the Lost West. Because in reality, it's not really gone. It's still here with us. Uh, on reservations and off them in the form of Métis people. It's here in the place names, it's here in the stories that color this place that we call home now. And uh, I just want you guys to go away with this with a little bit more of an appreciation for uh, this often forgotten story in North America. Uh, a little quick bibliography and acknowledgments. Uh, a lot of good reading on this material. I wish I could put more. Uh, Hudson's Bay Company Archives, big, big help if you want to research this kind of stuff. Uh, whole Country was one robe. This thing is a Bible for this region in particular. And of course, uh, special shout outs to two really good friends of mine uh, Matt Hilterman, he's a historian for the Metis Nation of Alberta, and uh, Amber Paquette, she is historian laureate for the city of Edmonton for all their help and assistance in tracking down some of these fur trade stories and uh, just giving me a better appreciation of the fact that, you know, these people never really went away. So with that, merci beaucoup, and I'll free it up to questions. I'll unmute the things that I'll unmute. When Lewis and Clark were in present-day North Dakota, and Lewis had a little bit of a, as I would interpret it, a terse, interaction with some of the British fur traders there. 
is, I don't remember reading anywhere in the journals about any interactions with any of the French on that, um, on, the, on the expedition, or with Charbonneau. Um, did Charbonneau say anything about his feelings about the British who were coming down and operating in that Mandan area, or was it just kind of uh, one big happy international family there around the Mandan Hidatsa villages? Uh, definitely, definitely not one big happy family out there. <laughs> Uh, the Spanish actually had dispatched expeditions up the Missouri in the form of Trudeau, McKay, and Evans to uh, kind of combat this British influence in what was their territory, and the same attitude prevailed with the Americans. Uh, Charbonneau was kind of in an awkward position because uh, he had been a former Northwest Companyman and was kind of living the life of a free trader, a translator for hire uh, at the time Lewis and Clark met him. Uh, reading the journals of Francois Antoine Le Roque, he is one of those guys that kind of had a very interesting interaction with Lewis and Clark. He didn't, didn't really like Lewis much, but thought Clark was a nice guy, um, which is kind of ironic because Le Roque was very interested in American ideas. He'd been educated in New York. Uh, but anyways, getting more to the point there, um, there's no real record of Charbonneau's thoughts or opinions on it, but judging by some of the things that later people talked about him with, I would definitely not put it past him to have said something in private to Lewis. I know Prince Maximilian in the 1830s uh, said that Charbonneau was a very great help, uh, kind of helping him understand the dynamics in the area. So I would not be surprised at all if uh, he was a similar guy for Lewis and Clark. I know LaRope spoke very highly of him. And, uh, yes. yep, sorry, we have one in the live audience. <laughs> um, what year, again, did the British, like, and Wolf, that battle between the French happen? Oh, uh, the Battle of Quebec, that is 1759. So. Are the Trudeaus related? Uh, as far as we know, there is actually no relation between the current Prime Minister of Canada and uh, the French explorer Trudeau. Uh, if there is, it's incredibly distant, but no, they're not related. Really. I have a question. Yeah. Um, merci. Um, what was the name of the I have a question. The question is, do you know anything about the French Canadians that were over in Nova Scotia? Ah, the Acadians. So, Nova Scotia is a very weird animal. It was technically not part of New France. It had been claimed by the British, uh, well, the Scottish first, hence the name Nova Scotia, New Scotland. Uh, they had had some issues with the Acadians on kind of the northern fringe of that territory. And essentially, what ended up happening is uh, they got forcefully removed in the years prior to the French and Indian War, as well as during. And uh, they ended up settling down in the southern tip of French Louisiana at the time, uh, giving rise to our Cajuns. Uh, that was actually a trend that kind of happened a lot in Spanish Louisiana in the years after the French and Indian War. Uh, you have a lot of families fleeing Quebec and heading for friendlier territory because they just do not want to be under British rule. Thank you. Merci. Of course. If, uh, if nobody else has a question about this particular program, Austin, can I ask you what programs are you currently presenting at the Interim Center? Uh, well, the winter season is a little bit slower, so we don't do our daily programs. Uh, in the past, I've done ones on fishing, uh, clothing, uh, things like Lewis's return trip, but yeah, it's it's a bit slower in the winter here. Uh, this was a very special thing. I want to definitely thank the Lewis and Clark Foundation, the Portage Route chapter, for uh, goading me into this. Um, they didn't have to go too hard, <laughs> but definitely definitely a pleasure to uh, have worked on this over the last couple months and see it come to fruition in one way or another. So.
But yeah, uh, other than that, nothing really going on in the uh, slower times of year for my programs, anyways. How many, how many people on an average will come into the center on a winter day? That is an incredibly hard question to answer because uh, it changes up all the time. Some days we'll get over 50, some days we'll have maybe two or three. So it just depends on how people are feeling. Uh, there's no real way to tell sometimes, but it's fun. It's, it's a great way to keep you on your toes. Uh, yes, Jay? Uh, just wondering what types of programs you're looking at, working on for the spring and the summer maybe. Oh, geez. Uh, programs for spring and summer, well, I do have one in the works for Travelers Rest State Park for uh, any of you guys out in the Missoula area. Uh, not going to be directly related to Lewis and Clark or the French here, but it will be on uh, the Bitterroot Valley in the mid-19th century, so if that tickles your fancy, uh, head on over to Travelers Rest. <laughs> but uh, other than that, just awesome. things that come up. Oh, yes. it be a Travelers Rest this summer? Yep, Travelers Rest uh, in April. I would like to thank all you guys on Zoom for tuning in to this and uh, all you guys here in our live audience. Uh, definitely, definitely means a lot. Thank you. Merci.